Um, welcome to Architecture Foundation uh, Bedtime Stories. Uh, my name is Frank Monaghan. I am living in Galway in the west of Ireland. Um, I studied architecture in London Metropolitan University in London and lived uh, in that wonderful city for almost 20 years. Um, and visit visit uh, frequently, but haven't been able to uh, these past few months for obvious reasons. Right, it's nine o'clock. Um, welcome again to everyone uh, to Artificial Foundation Bedtime Stories. I want to say thank you to Alicia and Rosie for for inviting me to participate in this. Um, uh, I'm in Galway, as I said, it's on the periphery, the western uh, sea shore of uh, Ireland. Um, Galway is a small city uh, of about 80,000 people, situated between the lovely Burn and Connemara, the mountains. So we're in a very, very beautiful place. Great place to be in lockdown. It is a European capital of culture uh, for 2020, but that's uh, pause has been pressed on that. Um, this evening I'm going to read a book by Mike McCormack called Solar Bones. Uh, this is a lovely copy from Charlie Burns Bookshop, the best bookshop in Ireland. Um, Mike is Head of Creative Writing at NUI Galway. Uh, the book is published by Tramp Press in 2016. Um, it's won numerous awards, notably the Borgash Energy Irish Book of the Year in 2019. Um, it's written as a stream of consciousness. Um, it spans one hour, but it's it's probably a bit like living in lockdown permanently. <laughs> um, you, it's it's when you lose yourself within it, uh, you lose actually all sense of sort of time because for its two hundred pages, what's uh, quite interesting about it is it has absolutely no no punctuation whatsoever. It's just one long sentence. There's no chapters from beginning to end. So it's it's uh, it's fragmented. Uh, modernist sort of novel, but it's 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 different at the same time. Um, so it's it's. Uh, I'll read the bump at the back. Marcus Conway is dead, but sometimes on All Souls Day, the dead return to us. Set in the west of Ireland, at the, as the recession is about to strike, Solar Bones tells the story of one man's experience as the world falls apart. A beautiful and haunting elegy, the novel of order and chaos. Love and loss captures how minor decisions ripple into waves and test our integrity every day. Uh, so it's just about an ordinary guy, he's an engineer. Um, nothing particularly happens, um, and I'm hoping that as I read you, you'll understand why I felt it was fitting for this particular uh, uh, theme uh, that we find ourselves in. Um, so I'm just going to proceed to, uh, to dive in. Solar Bones by Mike McCormick. Um, it is fragmented, like I say, the style written without full stops, so it's, it's quite difficult to read, so you'll have to forgive me. I'll try and read at a pace. Um, and we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. The bell, the bell, as hearing the bell, as hearing the bell, as standing here, the bell being heard standing here. Ring, hearing it ring out through this grey light of this morning, noon or night. God knows this grey day standing here and listening to this bell in the middle of the day, the middle of the day bell, the Angelus bell in the middle of the day, ringing out through the grey light to hear, standing in the kitchen, hearing this bell. And I'm moving forward. I was in the village and standing outside Kenny's shop. Whoops. Have I gone? No, I've gone too far. It's back here I want to be. Sorry. Standing here in this kitchen, only because it is woven into that memorial arch which curves from childhood to the present moment, gathering up memories of that time with my father on our farm, a skein of connections I am not likely to unravel at this moment, for fear they might banish forever the image of all those agricultural implements and machines which were kept around the barns during my childhood and which my father would take apart on the floor of the hay shed, simple constructs from an age when the world understood itself differently. 
ploughs, harrows and scuffers, pounds, shilling and pence, rough-hewn vernacular instruments that were primitively crude compared to the, the lathe elegance of the one true machine around which all the energy and work on the farm centred, the farm soul in many ways. The grey Massey Ferguson 35 my father bought at an agricultural show in Westport in the late 60s, paying £480 for it, a machine he was forever tinkering with, always scrutinising some part of its engine, peering into it, standing back from it and cleaning his hands on an old rag after having made some adjustment to its workings. A memory so clear to me now, here in this kitchen, that I could reach out and touch it with my hand, Man and machine, same as they were. The day I came home from school and walked into the hay shed to find him standing there over the engine, completely broken down and laid out on the concrete floor that was dusted with hay seed, piece by piece along its length. Cylinder head, pistons, crankshaft, to where I stood in the doorway in my school trousers and jumper, terrified at the sight because to one side lay the body of the 35, gutted off its most essential parts and forlorn now, its components ordered across the floor in such a way as to make clear not only the sequence of its dismantlement, but also the reverse order in which it could be restored to the full working harmonic of itself. And my father standing over the whole thing, sighting through a narrow length of fuel line, blowing through it till he was satisfied that it was clean through its length, before he laid it on the floor, giving it its proper place in the sequence and explaining to me, saying simply, it was burning oil, as if there was some viral malfunction likely to spread from the machine itself and affect the world's wider mechanism, throwing the universe itself out of kilter to bring it crashing down through the heavens, because I knew well that this dis dismantlement went beyond a fitter's examination of a diesel engine, went beyond stripping out the carburetor to clear the jets. Once again, my father had succumbed to the temptation to take something apart, just to see how it was put together, to know intimately what it was that he had put his faith in, as he stood over this altar of disassembly, with nothing in his hand but a single open-end spanner, which he waved over the assemblage as if it were a gesture of forgiveness. And when he told me that this single tool was capable of breaking down the entire tractor, dismantling the whole thing to the smallest component, and that it was then sufficient to its, in itself to put it back together again, without need of any other instrument. My fear only deepened as I recoiled at the thought that something so complex and highly achieved as this tractor engine could prove so vulnerable, so easily collapsible, and taken apart this single tool, and so frightened was I by this fact, it would be years afterwards before I could acknowledge the engineering eggs excellence, elegance of it all, and see it as my father did, something graceful and beautifully conceived, not the instrument of chaos it presented itself as to my childish imagination, and this may have been the first moment of anxious worry about the world, the first instance of my mind spiralling beyond the immediate environs of hearth, home and parish towards the wider world beyond, way beyond since looking at those engine parts spread across the floor, my imagination took fright and soared to some wider cataclysmic conclusion about how the universe itself was bolted and screwed together. Believing I saw here how heaven and earth could come unhinged when some essential cottering pin was tapped out which would undo the whole vast assemblage of stars and galaxies in their weeding rotations and send them plummeting through the void of space towards some final ruin out of the furthest mirroring of the universe. And even if my fear at that specific moment did not run to such complex detail, only such cosmic awareness could account for the waves of anxiety that gripped me as I stood over those engine parts on the hay shed floor, soul sick with an anxiety which was not soothed one bit the following day when my father drove the tractor out of the hay shed with a clear spout of smoke blurting from the exhaust and it bounced down the narrow mucky road and into the field beyond where it took off into the distance. My father perched up on the seat getting smaller and smaller in the dim light before man and machine disappeared into a dip in the land and we watched from the gable of the house. 
Annie, my mother in her housecoat, and Ethna, clutching the Polaroid camera which seldom left her hands. A present from visiting Yanks. Um, so, things can be set out of kilter from something very, very small. Um, next section I'm going to read. Straight into it. No full stops. I chanced upon a documentary which showed a growing man lying on a floor covered with large sheets of paper, A2 sheets, in which there were some very complex and detailed line drawings, page after page covered, and this narrow-shouldered man in a white shirt stretched out in the middle of them, drawing away with pencil and rule, adding yet another detailed sheet to all those around him. And I must have recognised the sort of drawing they were because I found myself sitting forward in the armchair, prodding the zapper in my hand to turn up the volumes so that I could hear the voiceover tell me that this man, some French man whose name I can't remember, suffered from a sort of high-level autism that left him socially inept and completely without any sense of humour or irony, but who was nevertheless designing out of thin air the most complete and complex urban plan history he had ever known. A project which had come to light when a few of the drawings were used to illustrate a Sunday Times magazine article on autism, which brought him to the attention of an urban planner at London City Council, who marvelled at the precise beauty of its streets and thoroughfares, but who was a lot more intrigued by the sprawling harmony hinted at beyond the margins of the cropped fragments that so took himself off to France to investigate this gifted planner, who no one in the urban design community had ever heard of, finding him eventually in a little village in the Vosges, where he lived with his partner, a mathematician and herself autistic, and who, having, after he'd spent a couple of days there, convinced the planner that he'd encountered a fully-fledged genius, a visionary who had not only a coherent sense of the vast megalopolis, which, after 15 years, was still metastasizing day by day over pages and pages, an astonishing achievement in itself, but more impressive from the point of view of a city planner, that this man's ability to hold in his mind's eye a sense of the city as an enormous dynamic organism which was continually morphing through the vast tides of those Sicilian rhythms that governed all its streets and infrastructure, and which this seer of outlined with sweeping gestures over the sheets of paper spread across the across the sitting room floor, speaking in a toneless voice which swept through the city with a running commentary on how it was performing at any specific time of the day, how and where all its crowds and traffic were flowing and what routes they took, to what points of convergence in the early morning rush hour, and what exactly the drain on utilities would be, how all its vertical and horizontal circuitry was functioning when water and electricity followed in the wake of crowds converging for work or entertainment in various parts and times of the city, while disgorging a flow of sewage, hydrocarbons and CO2 emissions from those same points, the savant holding in mind all the flows and shifts through the city streets and conduit, vast rhythms he could gauge in any hour of the day, any day of the week or any holiday, a phenomenal feat which had the urban planner at a loss to find some comparative image or simile. He talked about a 3D chess game and a multi-tiered symphony of people and environment, all vivid and suggestive, but each one falling some way short of the city's majestic multi-harmonic sprawl. While at the same time speaking to camera, he, the seer himself was down on the floor behind him with his pencil and square, adding another, yet another precinct to the city's expanse, a working-class suburban enclave with housing grouped around schools and shopping facilities, parking and leisure amenities, the concrete substratum of a fully realised community. While the city now stood, after 15 years solid work but with no end in sight, as by far the biggest and most complex urban plan ever conceived by man or committee, and which I could not help thinking as I sipped my beer and watched Wood as he struck at it and lived long enough, eclipsed the whole fucking world, this map of a kingdom that existed nowhere on this earth but in his head, 
this masterpiece with this clueless overlord, a mad king who knew nothing of the real world, but was nevertheless on such intimate terms with the infinite intricacies of his own mind that he needed nothing more than a rule and pencil to draw them forth and lay them on the paper. This city as a kind of neural maze, a cognitive map which would reach out street by street to cover the whole world and possibly for this reason on some or some other I could not fathom the program filled me with a sour bloom of resentment the focus of which I could not clearly discern but which quickly had me feeling so foolish I was embarrassed to be alone with myself in the sitting room feeling that someone invisible outside of myself was standing judge and jury over me pointing the finger at me saying have you nothing better for doing at this time of night than getting pissed off at the television? Seriously. We'll, we'll dip in again. A great day for cooling soup or pouring a foundation, whichever job was in front of you before the concrete sluiced from the pressurized hose over the middle of the shuttering pouring out of a thick slurry over the radon barrier pooling and then spreading under its own weight before eventually rising over the steel mesh when the men moved in with floats to spread it out evenly to the corners by which time i'd performed the first slump test upending the cone of concrete on the spot board and measuring the slump after the cone had been removed from around it to find that the fall was well within tolerance so that it was okay. I swept the concrete off the board and stood back to watch the men level out the screed, one of them stepping through it with the vibrator under his arm, pokering it into the concrete which immediately lost all of its resistance and liquefied to settle into its natural level between the, sh the shuttered sides so that the two men coming behind him could so smooth it over with a screeding board, drawing it over the wet surface to leave it glossed and smooth behind them. And even though I'd seen it done umpteen times before, there was still something to wonder at the pouring of a concrete foundation, the way it draws so many skills and strengths together, the timing and cooperation needed and the way the rising and spreading tide of concrete itself demarks as no other stage in the building process can, the actual from the theoretical, making the whole thing real in a way that side, site clearances or the digging out of the foundation itself can never do. All these are de definite staging posts in any structure transition from the abstract, but none of them separate so clearly the ideal realm of plans and paperwork from the physical world, from the pouring of concrete. The building at last beginning to rise out of the ground and seeing it for so many years on so many public buildings, libraries, water purifying plants, plants and so on. 20 years of this had not taken the excitement to, uh, out of it for me. That uncanny sense of a building beginning to take on mass and shape in the blue light of the world, where so many things can go wrong between this first pour and that ceremonial occasion when... I'm skipping ahead and doing a time check. Because it goes awful fast. Friday, March 21st. The day in which my wife was widowed and my two children lost their father. The day my name was unhinged from the man who owned it. Such a clear and detailed memory of my own death at the precise moment I said to myself through blinding pain. I'll just listen to these news headlines when, at that precise moment, the vast harmonic of my whole being was undone and I came apart in sheets and waves, torrential and ever falling. My grip on all those markers which gathered and held me to this world completely gone as the light around me blackened and for a split moment I saw this world in negative as all its colours bled to a narrow palette of black and grey with a complex melding of all shapes and outlines into each other. The mountains and sea converging onto the windscreen in front of me and somewhere above the earth the sun failed. Burned out from within, exhausted now, and nothing but a massive cinder drifting through the chasm of space, collapsing in on its own warm core 
before that too collapsed on itself, so that all light was now residual, ashen and dragging its own darkness down the void, as all around me every colour waned to a specific darkness, all things slackening and run down while time itself began, began to contract so tightly it would surely freeze at any moment, and any moment now there would be no now, and there may be these things, but none of these things will be now. To see myself lying in that car, stretched out behind the steering wheel with my body locked in its final throes, my left arm thrown across the passenger seat, clutching Maury's prescription in my hand, my whole upper body twisted towards it with my foot rammed on the accelerator and the engine gunned to the last, the car screaming at a hundred thousand revs, screaming. This is how an engineer loses himself. No accuracy anymore. All my angles tilted to infinity. Finally unbound from myself into a vast oblivion. And what was needed at this moment was not prayer or song, or one final moment of desperate strength gathering, that I might utter some bawling, annihilating curse, some anathema to drawn up from the depths of the world's being, where all inverse prayers are rooted in the first gasp of the world's existence, the first twitch of the void, something I could draw from those depths and lay on the world, only because man and boy, father and son, husband and engineer, I have known it to be a sacred and beautiful place, hallowed by human endeavour and energies, crossed with love and the continual weave of human circumstance. And since this is my wit's end, my post-mortem aria, my engineer's lament, with my mind vacant of everything good and affirmative, it is the place from which where I will give vent to some terrible curse, rolling it from my black mouth across the vast acreage of space, rolling it to the furthest horizons and further again, so that it chisels a new edge to the universe working itself out of the staggered depths of the void, where in this moment God might hear me and come looking for me, recognising a fellow engineer. My howling curse the sound of a decent man gone to his grave too soon. A man who went about his work and raised a family, everything about him marked by that degree of moderation, which he could now set against the darkness out of which he could come looking for me, as I did for him ever hopeful of finding our way to each other in this blackness which is our way and guide down into the thickening night where prayer and curse are conjoined at the one root and the inaugural moment of being down to those depths where only true believers can find their way those with the light drained from their eyes so that they can have full night vision and access to this complete absence of themselves where hand in my heart i say i died in that lane by lay by Died surrounded by tons of sand and gravel and hardcore, with my mouth open and a black howl to take leave of myself, as without missing a beat my body had already picked up the rhythms of decay which had begun to work immediately in my soft flesh. That momentary heat spike which gave way to the failing temperature of rot within my blood passing from oxygenated red to black as the universe's cellular explosions which bring it on that spillage of filth which in my organs, which will eventually purge from every orifice of my body, even as I found my way home. Home again, to sit at this table and drift through these rooms, room by room, agitated beyond all comfort, as if the giddiness of this day had got into my body and is now setting up again against that grating current inside me which brushes my nerve ends and has me so jittery there is nothing for it but to keep moving, drifting from room to room like one of those sea creatures who cannot stay still for fear they may sink and drown. Everything solid in me draining away towards the floor, going from room to room, killing these couple of hours before my wife and kids return, trying to shug off the sense of all things around me are unstable and barely rooted in the here and now, and that the slightest pressure would cause everything to tip away from me, as if it were all cardboard scenery, or like this house and the slightest push will send the whole thing skyward into the grey light leaving me. I'm here alone. 
here in this open space of the world with no walls or roofs or floors above me around me the sole inhabitant of a vast white space which is swept clear of fences and homesteads and plants and trees all gone the world is complete erasure since even the sun itself is drawn from the sky leaving me wholly alone fading whatever way it is we fade from this world animal mineral vegetable father husband citizen my body drawing its soul in its wake or vice versa until that total withdrawal into the vast whiteness is visible only as a brimming absence so that finally there is nothing left body and soul all gone and these residual pulses and rhythms which for these waning moments abide in their own recurrent measure nothing more than a vague strobing of the air before they too are obliterated in that self-engulfing light which closes over everything to be cast out beyond darkness into that vast unbroken commonage of space and time into that vast oblivion into which there are no markings or contours to steer by nor any songs to sing me home and where there is nothing else for it but to keep going one foot in front of the other the head down and keep going keep going keep going to fuck that is the end the bedtime story.